Thank you so much, Andrea, and uh, thank you to the Institute for hosting this uh, talk. Um, I am I'm assuming no knowledge of Piazza Fontana in, in this talk. I know that there will probably be people here who are experts on it or know a lot about it. Most Italians of a certain age would have lived through some of the events, but I'm not going to assume that, that any, I'm assuming that some people here don't know anything about it. So that's, what I'm, that's my kind of baseline. And it's impossible, of course, to, to cover everything about an event that had so many ramifications just 50 years ago in, and went in so many different areas. So what I'm going to do is, is take you through those four dramatic days uh, in December 1969 in the first part of my talk, the days from the bomb in the bank on the 12th of December up to the death of Giuseppe Pinelli on the 15th of December uh, and the arrests of various other people. And that's, that's kind of only the first part. I'm going to take you through the incredible events and what they meant. And then in the second half, I'm going to try and draw some conclusions about what that event meant 50 years on and over those 50 years in terms of three broad areas. One is the question of justice and truth. The second area is the area of culture and information. And the third area is the area of memory. So those are the themes that I'm going to draw out in, in, uh, in after I've discussed the events of those days. On the 12th of December 1969, a taxi driver was waiting in Piazza Beccaria in the centre of Milan. His name was Cornelio Rolandi. The client, um, a client got into his car. The client had long hair, not unusual for 1969, and said he wanted to go to the agricultural bank in Piazza Fontana. As the crow flies, the bank was only about 100 metres away from where the taxi was standing. Rolandi, the taxi driver, objected, said it was too close, it wasn't a good enough fare, but the man said he just needed dropping for a moment and then he would go elsewhere. Rolandi drove him to the corner of another street, further away from the bank than when they originally had started. The man got out, slammed the door and returned without the briefcase he had been carrying. They then drove off. This at least is the story that Cornelia, Cornelia Rolandi told three days later. Half an hour later, a huge explosion ripped through the main concourse of the agricultural bank in Piazza Fontana. It was around 16.37, 4.37 in the afternoon. The bank was still open, as was usual on a Friday, and packed with mainly rural traders doing deals or depositing cash. The bank was usually open until 6.30 on Fridays because it was mainly for agricultural people from the countryside doing all kinds of deals. There were 300 people in the bank when the bomb exploded. The bomb had been placed using a timer in a case under a large table in the middle of the room. In the photo, you can see the point of explosion of the bomb. You can't see any of the other objects that were around that table. Lots of people were sitting around that table when the bomb exploded. This was a place where people would usually arrange to meet or simply sit and wait. It caused carnage. 14 people were killed immediately, and over 80 injured, some very seriously. Three other victims were to die subsequently, some after quite a long period of time. It was a massacre, in the strage, the first of Italy's 1960s and 1970s, the first of many such incidents, many of them linked to that first original bomb, the strage di Piazza Fontana, named after the place, not after the bank, in which it exploded. In subsequent minutes after that bomb, three other bombs exploded in Rome. This wasn't just an isolated attack, it was a concerted, coordinated attack on two, the two major cities of Italy. Those bombs in Rome, the three bombs in Rome, caused damage and injury, but no deaths. A further bomb, which failed to explode, was found near a lift in the huge Banca Commerciale in Milan, uh, just opposite La Scala Opera House. For some reason, which has never been explained, the bomb was blown up by police in the courtyard of the bank soon after discovery. Of course, it would have been amazing evidence, but it was destroyed by the police who found it. Well, didn't find it, the people in the bank found it. The fragments of that bomb, much later on, would prove, would prove crucial, however, in identifying the origins of the devices. This was thus a coordinated and systematic attack across two major cities 
and in five focal points. It required resources, or money, organisation and iron will to carry out. But who was responsible and why had they placed those devices? The police appeared to know the answer. It was the anarchists. This chimed with Italy and Milan's history. In 1921, a bomb placed by anarchists aimed at Milan's police chief, who, was, who had arrested leading anarchist Enrico Malatesta, caused a number of deaths in a, in a place called the Teatro di Diana in the centre of Milan. This was a notorious attack in 1921. The Diana bomb was evoked by journalists and many others in the days that followed Piazza Fontana. But the decision to look towards the anarchist as responsible for the bomb also had a precise political aim. It said it had been brought by the student uprisings and protests of 1968 and the hot autumn of 1969, which saw the biggest strike wave ever seen in a European country, much of it in Milan. For many, the fabric of society appeared to be under threat. Individuals in the secret services, alongside neo-fascists, mainly from the Veneto region, and some figures in NATO, as well as Greek conspirators, devised a plan to force a coup in Italy by creating outrages and blaming them on the left. They called this plan the strategy of tension. We're still on the 12th of December. That evening, at about 6.45, on the day of the bomb, two hours after the bomb exploded, a 48-year-old railway worker called Giuseppe Pino Pinelli was arrested outside an anarchist club in Milan. The police, the police asked Pinelli to follow them to Milan's central police station on his scooter, which he duly did. I just ask you to think about that for a second. If you planted the bomb in a bank and you were arrested by the police, and the police said, just follow us on the scooter, I'll just leave that with you for now. <laughs> Another man was taken away in the police car itself. Pinelli was an anarchist, the most senior policeman who had arrested in the bar was a man called Luigi Calabresi, deputy head of the political unit of the Milanese police. From that moment on, those two men's fates were to be closely entwined. In some ways, their stories are still connected, even today. Pennelli was held and interrogated in the police station for three days and three nights. He was very rarely allowed to sleep and was given hardly any food in that time. At various times over this period, the police called Pinelli's wife, Licia, to provide them with information. They also went to Pinelli's house and searched it. After two days, uh, under Italian law at the time, an arrest needed to be compalitated by a magistrate. In Pinelli's case, this never happened. By the third day, he was being held illegally. I'm now going to move forward to 15th December. Pinelli has been in the police station for three days. Nobody else, a number of other people have been arrested, mainly anarchists, but also in some versions of events, they actually just picked up those of homeless people and took them in for the fare numero. Um, and interrogations are going on. I'm going to move forward to the 15th of December now. On the 15th of December, the funerals to 14 of the victims were held in Piazza Duomo in Milan. The main train, trade union federations had called a general strike for the day. Thousands of workers turned out in silence. It was an extraordinary demonstration of support for Italian democracy and the rule of law. And in many interpretations of Piazza Fontana, this funeral is very important because it's said to have stopped the attempt at bringing in an authoritarian solution or a coup uh, in Italy at that time. The power of the working class presence in that square um, was seen as a, a bulwark against, against such, a, such a solution. Still on the 15th of December, I'm going to shift across Milan, not very far, to the Palace of Justice, which actually is about 300 yards from Piazza Fontana. At the same time, that morning, the 15th of December, another anarchist, a 36-year-old dancer called Pietro Valperga, had reported to a magistrate in the centre of Milan in the huge fascist-built Palace of Justice. He was there to answer charges of insulting the Pope. 
Again, I just want you to think about this for a second. Pietro Val Pedro would later be accused of being the bomber, the man in the taxi for Piazza Fontana. I just want you to think that you being the person who placed the bomb in the bank. And the next uh, three days later, in the morning, you just wander along to the Justice Palace to answer charges of insulting the Pope at a place that is extremely close to the place you just killed 14 people with in, in the bank. I just want you to believe that with you for a second. The Palace of Justice is five minutes' walk from Piazza Fontana. Valpreda, a well known anarchist active mainly in Rome, was arrested and taken to Rome illegally, where the investigation had been moved, despite the fact that the only victims of the bombs have been in Milan. And there's a whole debate about where this case is going to be investigated, where the trials are going to take place. I'll leave that a bit for later, but it's something we might come back to. A battle between Rome and Milan and other cities over who is going to look after this case. Hours earlier, still on the 15th of December, everything happens on the 15th of December, the taxi driver, Cornelia Rolandi, had gone into a Carabinieri station in the centre of the city. He had told his story about the passenger on the 12th, and had been shown some photos, including a photo of our prayer. Again, this is illegal in terms of there's going to be an ID parade a bit later, and this actually is a problem. In one of the photos, he recognised his passenger from the 12th of December. It was a photo of Pietro Valpreda, a very recognisable character at the, at the time. Meanwhile, the first of many leaks began to hit the media. In Milan, Bruno Vespa, you might have heard of, then a Rai reporter, made a sensational re re revelation. We have a guilty person, he told um, hit the people watching TV live. Abbiamo un colpevole and that was Pietro Valpeda who'd been arrested under investigation. There'd been a trial yet, there wouldn't be a trial for another number of years, um, but already the, the monster had been uh, pushed onto the front pages of the newspapers and in, on TV. In Rome, where both of them had been, been transported, Rolandi by, by plane, Valpeda by car, there was an ID parade. Um, Cornelia Rolandi was faced with um, Here we are. There's a very famous picture of the ID parade. Um, I wonder if you can work out which one's our parade there. Um, uh, yes, it's very difficult to, uh, to tell uh, which one is our parade from that picture. Uh, this, is the, this is what um, Rolandi was presented with when he, when he, on the 15th of December in, the, in, in, in Rome, when he was um, uh, um, asked to identify the person he had, he had allegedly carried in a taxi. And he said in Milanese, I'm not going to try it, he said, it's him. And Valpreda replied, are you sure? And Rolandi then said, well, if it isn't him, who is it? Um, this is the main evidence, by the way, against Pietro Valpreda in the trials that were to follow. Valpreda would not be cleared, finally, of the uh, bombing of Piazza Montana until 1987. He would spend three years in prison without trial. The law had to be changed to release him from prison. A special law called the Valpreda Law was passed in 1972 because he'd spent three years without being tried, which was against the human rights of most countries in the world. Rolandi died of a lung illness on the 16th of July, 1971. He left his testimony with the police. It was, more or less, the only evidence against Val Prada. There's a whole lot of circumstantial evidence. The police tried to bring articles Val Prada had written. Uh, he didn't have an alibi, or they did, and so on. But the main kind of concrete evidence is Rolandi's testimony. Um, and again, I leave that with you, that way you can build a whole uh, trial on the back of that. Meanwhile, back in Milan's police station, we're now coming towards the night, uh, but Pinelli has been interrogated for three days and three nights, and perhaps the most extraordinary and controversial event of all was about to take place. At about midnight on the 15th of December, a journalist was smoking a cigarette in the courtyard of the ground floor of Milan's central Questura police station. He heard a strange sound from above. It was a body which had precipitated from a window on the fourth floor and landed on the ground. The body was that of Giuseppe Pinelli. He was still alive, but only just. Transported to a local hospital, accompanied by a policeman, he died less than two hours later with a fractured skull and other injuries. What had happened? How had the railway worker died? 
Why had he fallen from the window? At 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. on the morning of the 16th of December, the next day, after the funeral and the arrest of Alpreda and the death of Pinelli, the police chief of Man, Milan, Marcello Guida, called a press conference, 2 o'clock in the morning. It was sparsely attended, but important journalists like Corrado Stagliano, Giampaolo Panza, um, had turned up, in, and as well as a very important journalist in the story, a woman called Camilla Cerena. Um, all three would become deeply involved in the story. Cederna was a celebrated journalist, but she mainly worked on kind of chronica and costume. She didn't work on political cases. This would all change with the so-called Pinelli case. That night, Guida and the police told a pack of lies. They said that Pinelli, Pinelli was deeply implicated in the uh, Piazza Fontana bomb, and they had committed suicide when under investigation, crying out, it's the end of anarchy, as he flew out the window. The Pinelli case rocked public opinion. Pinelli became the 18th victim of Piazza Fontana. In fact, he is officially now a victim of Piazza Fontana, official Italian designation of that. The Pinelli case divided Italy. It divided Milan, it divided um, public opinion, it divided the press, it divided politically a number of um, everybody in, in two. And many people have compared it to the Dreyfus case in France at the turn of the 19th, 20th century. So, 12th to 15th of December, an extraordinary four days in the history of Italy, a series of shocking, inexplicable and bewildering events in Milan and Rome, a deadly bomb in a bank, the arrest and death of an innocent anarchist, the arrest of another anarchist who would also turn out to be innocent. It was a turning point, a radicalisation, a set of scandals. Nothing would ever be the same again. And many people have used this phrase, the loss of innocence, uh, with regard to Piazza Fontana. Four days, 15 deaths, because the other people from the bomb had not yet died, they would die in hospital. One person would die after a year from their injuries. They're still victims of the bomb. Um, and a number of mysteries were now open. These four days were to hang over the history of Milan and Italy as a whole for the next 49 and a half years. They were to lead to numerous investigations, false trails, a word that's untranslatable in, time, in English, depistaggi, cover-ups, further deaths, demonstrations, violence, and widespread disaffection with the Italian state. 49 years later, we still don't know the full story. Who placed the bombs, for example? Or what exactly happened to Giuseppe Pinelli in that office on the 15th of December, 1969? Two mysteries, divided truths. This was like a real bomb and a metaphorical bomb that was blown up, thrown into an already volatile situation and context. So what has happened in the 49 years since uh, that bomb and the death of Pinelli? Um, what, do the, what impact did those four shocking days in Milan and Rome have on Italy? And as I said at the start, I can't cover everything. And I would really highly recommend that people who are interested in this story uh, buy and read uh, Benedetta Tobaggi's new book about the case. It's really the best thing, I'm biased. Um, but it's the best thing written on Piazza Fontana. It's called Il Processo Impossibile, an impossible trial. Unfortunately, only available in Italian, but um, a brilliant, brilliant uh, account of what happened in the, imme the immediate trial and the aftermath and the facts of the case and the investigations. So as I said, I'm going to divide up my discussion of those events and their impact into three broad areas. And the first one is justice. The bomb alone, so just the facts of the 12th of December uh, in the bank in Milan, has led to eight major trials and numerous other investigations and processes. In some of those, Falcredo was one of the accused. He was only finally cleared, as I said, in 1987. Um, many of the trials were held a long way from Milan, in Catanzaro, in Calabria. This was because, according to the Italian state, it was too dangerous to hold the trials in Milan because of public order worries. 
what that really meant was a, desire, a nightmare for the, for the victims of the relatives, the relatives of the victims who had to travel uh, 1,200 kilometres to attend the trial. It also meant an attempt that failed was to keep the trials out of the glare of public opinion, which they didn't succeed in doing because a very hardy and amazing group of journalists went down there and covered every day of those, of those very long and complicated trials. Um, slowly, over the years, since 1969, and with immense difficulty, magistrates, brave magistrates, uh, who went against the grain and what they were being ordered to do, began to look elsewhere for the facts of the case, away from the anarchists, away from Valparaiso and his tiny group of anarchists, towards other evidence which was much stronger, the forensic evidence of the bags and the timers and the bombs, and many other eyewitnesses who began to, what began to emerge was a story of neo-fascists, particularly from the Veneto region, particularly from Padua and Mestre, who had been uh, plotting with um, parts of the security services of Italy to carry out bomb attacks and to blame them on the left, and thereby causing chaos and leading to authoritarian laws, possibly a coup, who knows? Uh, and who knows at what level this was discovered. And it became clear from these, the, the work of these courageous magistrates that there was a lot of evidence about timers, explosive bags, bought in Padua, um, which linked up to certain individuals in that city. Nonetheless, other parts of the magistrates, other parts of the judiciary, wouldn't drop the idea of the anarchist bomb. So what you get are two sets of magistrates moving forward with two incompatible stories. The anarchist story, uh, that it was the anarchists were wanting to attack symbols of capitalism and place bombs in banks because that's what anarchists do. And the neo-fascist story, two carried forward. And we get to this bizarre moment in Italian history of a trial in Catanzaro where the neo-fascists are on trial with Valparaiso as if they were working together. Um, now that collapses in later trials, but that's the first kind of way the, um, the, 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 the attempt to resolve the case is taking place. The Piazza Fontana case had a very negative effect on public opinion and its idea of justice. The Italian state, the Italian justice system was unable to find or prosecute the guilty people for um, the Piazza Fontana bar. It had the right people, it found the right people, um, but it could not bring them to a final verdict. So we have this situation after eight trials, after 100,000 folders of documents have been produced, after numerous appeals and people escaping abroad and lawyers and summings up, we have, a, we have no guilty person identified by the Italian state who placed the bomb and no guilty people for the conspiracy to place the bomb. We have people who are very closely linked to that case, but the Italian state and the Italian justice system failed miserably to resolve this case. And that's in part because the Italian state was involved in this case. And that was exposed very early on, and I'll come back to that when I talk about information and counter-information in this period. Giuseppe Pinelli and his family did not receive justice either. A first investigation was closed in 1970 with the conclusion that Pinelli committed suicide and that there was strong evidence against him. None of this evidence was ever produced, apart from the fact that Pinelli worked in the railways and there had been some bombs on the railways. But that was you know, a rather tenuous, and he was an anarchist, a tenuous link. A further and much more serious investigation ended in 1975 with no recommendation for trial. Its conclusion was different. Pennelli had not committed suicide, but had suffered from an active illness and fallen out of the window. This was a ridiculous conclusion in Maloria, famous Maloria Ativo. But it allowed the state to avoid saying that a person under their interrogation and care had been murdered. The other point about that investigation is that it said that every single policeman who had testified about the Pennelli case, including all the people in the room, had lied. Um, the judge Ambrosio, Ambrosio said that Pinelli fell, feeling ill, feeling faint. And that's not what happened, almost certainly. But um, he also said that all the policemen had lied. So he, he laid the way open 
for a further conclusion to the case. In the meantime, more blood had been spilled. The policeman who had arrested and interrogated Pinelli, Luigi Cabrese, was the subject of a campaign on the far left. Calabresi. Yeah, I'll get to him. Um, which identified him as responsible for Pinelli's death. He sued the left wing paper Lotta Continua, but the trial turned into the first and only public trial around Pinelli's death. So he sued the paper saying he had nothing to do with Pinelli's death. The trial was turned around onto him. Um, in terms of the, invest the way it worked, it became a political trial and was then abandoned by the people who had actually called it. Camilla Chiderna, you remember her from the press conference in the, on 16th of December, she wrote a best-selling book, book about based in part on that libel trial. On the 26th of May 1972, Calabresi was shot dead outside his, sorry, the 17th of May, was shot dead outside his house in Milan as he walked his car. Decades later, three men, members of left-wing group Lotta Continua were convicted of this crime. This case, like the Benelli case, like the Piazza Fontana case, continues to divide Italians on the facts, on the memory, and on the legacy. In all, Piazza Fontana was a disaster for the credibility of Italy's police forces, its judiciary, and its secret services. It fomented numerous conspiracy theories and what Italians called dietrologia, behind the scenes ology, the explaining of something by a conspiracy or a plot, and the way that the fact that justice didn't get to a conclusion and didn't find a guilty person at the end of all these trials helped all those conspiracy theorists to, um, to push their theories, some of which were crazy, some of which had more basis in reality. Nobody was satisfied. There was no judicial closure. And of course, there won't be any more trials about this because most of the people involved are now dead. And the, it's very unlikely that new documentation will emerge uh, concerning these events. So now I want to move on to the second theme uh, relating to the Piazzantana trial um, case and Pinelli, which is that of culture and counterinformation. Piazza Fontana and the Pinelli case produced a rich series of cultural forms. <laughs> Within journalism, it gave birth to a movement of counterinformation, with journalists working together and not naming themselves often anonymously and independently as um, outside of the mainstream media. I mean, we think that just comes from social media and Twitter and, and Facebook. It's got a very long history of, um, of, of counter-information. The most important example of counter-information was the collective book Stradge di Stato, which became a bestseller, some people say 500,000 copies, and led to a strong belief amongst many, especially on the left, but also within many moderate groups, that the bomb had been planted by neo-fascists with the connivance of the state and that Val Prado was innocent. Now, it wasn't all, not all of his conclusions were correct, but in many cases it identified um, dodgy parts of the investigation or strange parts of the investigation, which were then clearly uh, had to be reinvestigated by the authorities. Many established journalists also took up the case and became kind of counter-information activists themselves I mentioned some of them already, Camina Cederna, Giorgio Bocca, Corrado Stoiano, Marco Nozza. Nozza's book, I Pistaroli, recounts how this group of journalists followed the investigation and trials. For years, they became completely obsessed with the Piazza Fontana case, as are many people, as am I, in fact, and, um, and followed the trials around and, and interviewed the people and, and you know, wrote books about it. And all these journalists are still, many of them dead, but some of them still alive, associated with the Piazza Fontana case. So, in terms of information and the press and the media, um, Piazza Fontana had a very interesting effect on, um, on what happened uh, and the way the mainstream media was viewed uh, at the time, especially the treatment of El Prado. The campaigns around Pinelli and Piazza Fontana were also taken up by poets, songwriters, and artists. In 1972, Enrico Bai completed his enormous picture installation the funeral of the anarchist Pinelli. Based lo loosely on a painting by Carlo Carrà, this huge painting was to be displayed in the extraordinary setting 
of the Sala del Caritidi in Milan, where Picasso's Guernica had once been shown. The date of the opening was the 17th of May, 1972. That morning, by sheer chance, as I've already said, police chief Luigi Calabresi was shot dead in Milan. The show never opened. Bai's painting was not to be seen in public for more than 30 years and remains inaccessible today. Bai donated the painting to Lucia Pinelli, um, Pinelli's wife, before his death. And there, are talk, there is talk now of it finally being displayed in Milan, uh, but it's still taboo uh, because of the divisions opened up by the death of Calabresi uh, in 1972, which is still very raw in many cases. Um, I actually, uh, as a side story, I went to see Enrico Bai when he was still alive um, way back in the 90s and he very, was incredibly nice to me and he actually gave me the original, one of the original catalogues from that exhibition that never opened, which is a, one of my most prized possessions, I must say. Um, the most famous artistic output from the Panini case was Dario Fe's accidental death of an which I'm sure many of you are aware of and familiar with. First performed in 1970, this exhilarating political farce used real material from the case to undermine the credibility of the police and to pour scorn on the institutions of the state. It was a massive success and a radical piece of political theatre. Translated into hundreds of languages, I saw it many years ago on the West End where it had a long run uh, in a brilliant production with uh, Gavin Richards and still performed across the world. Flo's play was flexible and part of the campaign for justice for Penelli. It would always be followed a performance by the dreaded debate and, and could be altered with material emerging from trials and investigations. It played around with the absurdities of the police version of events, the phrase the Bazzo Fellino, uh, used by the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, cat-like jump of Penelli as he leapt out the window, um, was, off, was so had great fun with, with that phrase. And, um, saying, you know, should they have, did they have a trampoline and, you know, all that kind of stuff he played around with in the play. Uh, and that's the power of the play, I think, is it's, it's, it's the ridicule of the, of the police case, using real material. Artists and graphic designers also worked on propaganda material around the case. Um, uh, and, 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 and that was used in demonstrations, so it was all intensely political. Numerous books have been dedicated to Piazza Santana by journalists, by writers, there are even novels, there are um, personal accounts, there are autobiographical accounts, some of which you can find outside at the bookstore. And I mentioned, already mentioned Benedetta Tabaji's book, which I think in many ways is taking the, 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 um, the discussion to another level. Um, third um, theme is that of memory, which is something I've been very interested in um, over the years uh, in studying. Um, I, at one time, I did research on every single anniversary of Piazza Fontana to see what happened in Milan. And there is still a demonstration every year on 12th of December. Uh, now detached somewhat from the facts on, and the actual campaign around Piazza Fontana, but in the early years, extremely violent. Uh, and, and, uh, and also in Rome, and, and um, Marco was, was a victim of that as well. That's that climate of fear. The first few years, there would always be a riot, and actually the other deaths that followed on the 12th of December, including a student on the first anniversary of Piazza Fontana. So the men, this is hot memory, this is violent memory, this is divisive memory, which is being produced by Piazza Fontana. Memory which is not lying down, which is not comfortable, which is not, um, which is not at all something which we could, we're, we're able to, it's not resolved, it's not shared in any way. Um, that's Severius, that's Sartorelius, spell wrong, sorry, who, who died on the first anniversary, very close to Piazza Fontana, shot by a tear gas canister in his chest at close range, a uh, 21-year-old student. Um, I'm going to talk about memory, in, um, above all, in terms of marble memory, in terms of the plaques, uh, the way it's been, but that's only one part of the memory, of course. There are many other forms of memory, be they personal, be they emotional, be they in terms of uh, political mobilisation, but I'm going to concentrate, um, also because it's something I've worked on, on the marble memory because the marble memory in this case is very important. So in 1977, um, two plaques emerge uh, in Piazza Fontana itself. One is the kind of traditional um, democratic uh, victim's plaque. And I just as a side point, 
One of the interesting things about Yasuantana is the lack of power of the victims. I would doubt that anybody here, I may be wrong, could name any of the victims of Yasuantana. <coughs> it was partly because they were farmers, they were people from outside Milan, they were many, many of them were quite old, um, but they, didn't, they didn't, weren't able to form a memory of themselves. In fact, the victim of Piazzantana, who's most well known, is Giuseppe Pinelli, who wasn't even a victim of the bomb, but of the side events of the bomb. Um, so the, left, the plaque you can see on uh, my left um, is the one that was produced by the Democratic Committee, which campaigned around Piazzantana, which supported the families, and it's simply a list of victims. Um, and that would later be in a different form, put up front of the bank uh, at the 10th anniversary, you can still see it there. It's very hard to read, it's very long-winded, um, and it's a list of the victims which has been added to as the victims have been added. And it's not in a very effective form of memory. The other, much smaller plaque, is a much more controversial, and yet also much more effective form of memory, and that's dedicated to Giuseppe Pinelli. And it was put up illegally by a group of students and militants in 1977. And it says something very simple. It, laid down, it lays down one version of events um, in terms of Giuseppe Pinelli's death. Um, Giuseppe Pinelli, anarchist railway worker, killed as an innocent man in the rooms of the police station. So it's a very strong version of the Pinelli story. It's that he was murdered and thrown out the window. Now, that's one possibility we don't know. We have no proof that that happened, uh, because we don't know what happened in that room, and we probably never will know exactly what happened. Most of the people now are no longer with us. I think all of them, in fact, are dead. So this plan was put up in 1977, and it was numerous times smashed up by neo-fascists. It was removed by the authorities. It was then put back, and it remained there almost um, as a fact of inertia. It was defended as the memory of Benelli for a very long time, for more than 30 or 40 years. That's the more traditional plaque. You can see how long the uh, message is. I'm not going to read it out. It's a very, um, it's the product of a compromise, and you can tell by the form of it. And uh, in fact, it, if, you, if you go to Piazza some time, it's a place I've often been to, watch people's reactions, hardly anyone notices this plaque. Quite a lot of people notice the other plaques because they're more striking and the position they're in. Um, Pinelli himself is reburied in a place called Carrara in Tuscany, a place of traditionally of anarchists, uh, later on in the 1980s, um, and uh, with this extraordinary tomb, um, with a massive piece of marble, to Pino from the anarchists. If you ever get a chance to go, I'm a, I, maybe I'm a bit weird, I like graveyards, uh, um, but um, I particularly like political things in graveyards, and there's the anarchist part of this graveyard, which is one of my favourite places. Um, I remember one of the inscriptions was, do not pray on this tomb, please. Uh, there was another one. Uh, with an inscription of, of Pinelli's favourite book, which was Spoon River by Edgar D. Martis, Masters on the front. Um, so they moved him away from Milan. The family took that decision. But back in Milan, in Piazza Fontana, we have an extraordinary situation in 2006, because the original Pinelli plaque was there from 1977. As I said, knocked down, paint thrown over it, um, but still there. And in 2006, the mayor of Milan, a man called Albertini, in the middle of the night, gets some people to remove that plaque and put another one up. Same size, same shape, uh, same position, different message. And the message is marginally different, but actually in many ways completely different. Instead of an innocent man killed, it's an innocent man who died tragically in the rooms of the police station, blah, 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 everything else is the same. It's the bizarre moment when you have an official copying of an unofficial illegal plaque with one word changed and the other one taken away. What happened the day after, the anarchists and the other people from the movement got an old plaque that they still had, put it back up again. Uh, the other one was never given back, no one knows where it is, it's hidden away in some room or something, or it's been thrown in the rubbish bin or something. So we don't know what happened. This is the, the one that was replaced. They went back and said, no, you're not taking that away. Put it back and it's still there. So what you have here, and of course there's someone who works in divided memory, this is the perfect moment. Um, you have two versions of the same story next to each other, side by side, take your pick. Which one? Neither of them might be true. Maybe not either of them are true. Maybe something else happened. We don't know. Um, but there are two versions there. 
out there in the piazza, and the Italian state has said, we don't know, we, we're not going to tell you what happens because we, we say it's an active illness and no one's put that one up. Um, so uh, that would be a third pack, in fact there was a proposal for a third pack. Um, but you've got the two, and I think it's actually quite a good solution. Why not have that? Why not be, it's an ambiguous story, uh, and why not be ambiguous with your memory? Why do you have to be so straightforward with it? I think in Britain we always think there's one version of that. There isn't. Um, so the memory continues, but people are starting to die. The, the, the living memory is starting to move out. The conflicts over Pinelli, over Pies and Montana are not what they were. Um, the anniversaries are attended by less and less people. Um, they cause less and less controversy. There's not going to be any more trials, there's not going to be any more revelations. So we have to come to peace with this failure. We have to come, come to peace as people who work on Italy, as people who are interested in truth and justice. But we're not ever going to have the final story. We can come close to it. We can reconstruct what happened. We can reconstruct the individuals uh, who probably planted, uh, or at least organized the planting of the bombs. We probably know who they were. We, we almost certainly know where the bags were bought. We know where the exposures were bought. We know where the times were bought. So we can, we can say that. But the Italian state can't say that. And that's a tragedy for Italy, and it's a tragedy for all the people who are involved in those in those um, in those in, in those events, you know, Pinelli and the other and the people in the bank and Bob Prader and everyone else. Um, and I think, looking back 50 years on, I think the lack of closure, the lack of truth, and the lack of justice are very serious events that had a very deep impact on the 1970s and the blood that was spilled. There's a, a trail of blood that runs from 1969 and continues to run all through the 70s and 80s and a trail of people being imprisoned for things they didn't do and, and it, those things were not resolved and I think uh, in many ways the really terrible conclusion is that the strategy of tension in some ways worked. Okay there wasn't a coup, democracy survived but democracy survived in a bloated and um, problematic way. And that bomb had much more effect than we would like to think. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, it's always a pleasure and it's always a great honor to host you here. And uh, you know very well how much uh, I do like your research, your books, uh, I love so much the one about Franco Basaglia. And uh, I completely agree with John Foote about the role of the justice and the endless trial. Trial, is it? Oh, yes. Trial, sorry. The only thing is just I have to just say one note in my position. I mean, as a member of the Uh, there is a vice president of the Italian government right now that used to sell water and orange and something else at the stadium in Naples, so I could do this. As a member of the Italian state in UK, directing the most important institution after the embassy, I have to say that Italy has many, many problems, but in many of these institutional places, like this one, we are still very happy to get talks like this one. So we are in a problematic period. But there are some institutions that are still very, very open to get talks like that. And uh, my personal opinion is that I completely agree with John. Many cases in the Italian recent 